In the third module, we're going to talk about, in some detail, the problems that decentralized finance actually solves. I've already given you like an overview of, of these problems, um, but I want to go into more detail. Because in understanding the problems, you see the potential of this space. So we'll talk about inefficiency, limited access, opacity, centralized control, and lack of interoperability. So let's uh, take a look. Um, we begin by inefficiency. So think about DeFi in terms of what it can accomplish. So DeFi can accomplish uh, basically very high volumes of uh, transactions with very low frictions which would be an organizational burden. As I've said uh, previously, that to transfer uh, the equivalent of $100 or $100 million, that is basically the same thing in terms of ease of, of actual execution of that transaction. But it goes deeper uh, than that, that the contracts, these smart contracts that are designed, can be reused. Okay, so it's not like you're building something and then you have to rebuild it or you have to specialize it for every single application. These can be uh, reused in the form of these decentralized applications and, uh, and it gives a lot of leeway in terms of what you do. Um, the size of the transaction is pretty well irrelevant. I will qualify this a little bit uh, in that given that the gas fees are so high uh, right now, that does provide uh, a barrier to some smaller uh, transactions. But in my opinion, that is a problem that will be solved uh, in the future. So there's no organizational overhead. So there's no brick and mortar. There's no layers of middle people. So a user can operate within the parameters of the smart contract and um, the contract on, on whatever uh, blockchain it resides. I'm mainly talking about Ethereum, but there are other blockchains, not the Bitcoin blockchain, that also uh, can host uh, decentralized uh, applications. So, um, so basically, this is open to anybody. There's no interview that's necessary. There's no checks. Uh, this is, uh, can be used by anyone. So this is a technology of inclusion. It's a technology of financial um, democracy. And once that contract is deployed, it lives forever on the Ethereum blockchain, for example. So it's there. There's no uh, organizational overhead. So, so this is uh, another attribute of efficiency. So keepers, it's something that we should uh, understand. So keepers are external participants that are incentivized to maintain a service for uh, decentralized finance pro protocols. Okay, so for example, they might monitor the collateral that you posted for a transaction. And if the collateral dips in value below a certain point, then they will liquidate your position. So they're providing a service and they get paid for it. So this isn't automatic. So these are, are, are actual uh, agents that are essentially providing the service to a decentralized finance uh, application to keep it running uh, the way it should be running and to reduce the risk and they get rewarded uh, for that. So um, the, the actual uh, payment that these keepers get is market-based. 
Think about it as an auction that happens. And uh, they are an integral part of this network. So, uh, and this is a general point that within DeFi it's structured in a way that the users are essentially paying market prices for the services they need. So this is a lot different than centralized finance where you're not paying market prices for the services. So I uh, did a wire transfer, um, dollars to euros um, the other week. And I was quoted um, a rate and I was told I'm such a good customer of the bank that they would waive the fee. Well, the rate I was quoted was not a market rate. Indeed, it was 3% off the market rate. Okay, so again, this is just an example in centralized finance of a bank making a fee on a fairly straightforward transfer of dollars to euros. So this doesn't exist in the same way in terms of decentralized uh, finance. There's another aspect that's fascinating, and it's the idea of forking. So let's say that there's a smart contract out there, and you've got an idea to improve it. Well, what you can do is copy the code that's public access. So all the smart contracts, the code is publicly available and you can make that improvement or upgrade and launch it and potentially take business away from the old smart contract that you effectively copied and improved upon. So, so think about that. It's a deep idea that instead of reinventing the wheel, having to do all of the steps of designing the contract and then improving it, you can actually start with the existing contract. You can make the changes and you've got something better. It is so easy to fork. And this basically makes everything much more efficient. So think of a, like a small change that is important, but maybe not as important to invest all the time of building something from the bottom up. Well, you don't need to build from the bottom up. You can actually take what is there, improve upon it, and redeploy another smart uh, contract. So this is a very powerful idea within uh, decentralized uh, finance. It's also the true um, that uh, th this is a general uh, thing for not just uh, the average smart contract, but decentralized apps also. Um, again, uh, if you've got an idea for improvement, it's easy to create a new uh, DAP. And all of these uh, DAPs are forkable. So again, this really helps with the efficiency of the technology. Um, there is a term uh, in my word cloud called vampirism. And because of the open nature of decentralized finance, anybody can just go copy the current technology. So technology might be working fine, but you copy it and perhaps you, you provide an incentive mechanism for people to switch from the, uh, the contract that you basically uh, grabbed um, to your uh, protocol. So it's really intense uh, competition because then if there's enough people using the new uh, platform, then the old platform might need to change its incentives. And in the end, the users get the best deal. Um, so there's also risks that are associated with vampirism. Um, it could be that, and we'll talk about this in much more detail in the fourth course, that, uh, that some of these rewards are flawed and it could create a situation where people lose uh, a lot of money. And it's also possible that, uh, that the code is effectively hijacked and, and modified in a way that leads to additional risks. And we'll talk about specific examples of that where uh, a smart contract was taken and modified in a way 
that led to a vulnerability. And this happens, you need to beware if somebody is, is doing this. These protocols are not without risk. And that's an important part of this course.